How does language affect our cultural identity? Welcome to Philosopher's Corner. I'm John. How does language affect our cultural identity? In a sense, language is our audio cultural identity. I covered language in another video and language is a form of communication that we create. And language can be any form of communication. It can be telepathic, it can be verbal, it can be musical, it can be through general art, it can be the language of movies, the language of math, the language of science. Any form of agreed upon communication can become language. Now, in the sense of what we're discussing, how does language affect our cultural identity? Well, you know what? We'll keep it broad, but we'll start with what we're doing right now. I'm speaking English. And more to the point, I'm speaking a form of Southern California English that has also been influenced by university education, living throughout the United States of America, uh, living in parts of Europe, traveling around, absorbing tons of modern media, and meeting innumerable amounts of other people from around the world. And so now, the version of English that I'm speaking to you is 21st century Southern California pan global common English as opposed to 15th century, you know, English or old English or mid English or uh, even current modern British English or Scottish English or all sorts of different English. In fact, I like to tell a lot of people I say, uh, I speak, I speak English, but I speak a thousand forms of English because as I travel throughout the country, I have the ability to speak Southern English or Northeastern English or, uh, poor English or rich English, or I can speak throughout all the different, uh, ethnic versions of English. I can use all sorts of modern slang. I can use. I can use new slang. I can use old slang. I have proficiency in all these different dialects. I have proficiency in all these different offshoots of modern English based on region, based on socioeconomic level, based on types of metaphors we use, all sorts of things. And that sort of gets to the point about the place that language plays in our cultural identity. For instance, Americans, the classic example is if you take a few Americans and you say, and you ask them to describe a soft drink to you. And if somebody says, I'll have a Coke, kind of know where they're from. If they say, I'll have a pop, I know where they're from. And if they say, I'll have a soda, you kind of know where they're from. And that sort of telltale sign in the language is prevalent for most things. The famous musical, My Fair Lady is about a professor, Professor Higgins, who is a speech coach and he occupies a position in the aristocracy of England. And he has a bet with his friend who's this ex military guy who also has a position within the establishment that the only difference for passing in English society at that time was the level of the language. So he makes a bet with his friend that he could take a flower girl who at the time is that's very low on the socioeconomic level. He could take any common flower girl who speaks with a terrible low class accent. And if he had the chance to train her, he could pass her off as royalty. And so he does. He proves his point. He gives her elocution lessons and erudition and teaches her how to speak properly and 
passes her off, gets her into these uh, balls, and everybody gives her a backstory, and then everybody accepts her as upper class and even royalty. Of course, in that story, he falls in love with her, and it exposes what his the ignorance of his heart was, because he had been a lifelong bachelor, and he had been prejudiced against the lower classes, and then through working with this woman, uh, he falls in love with her, and it shows the power of language. At first, it kept them apart, and then it brought them together. Now, in terms of forming a cultural identity, the everyday vocal language that we speak communicates the context of who we are. If someone speaks according to the textbook version of the language of the country they're in, there's a certain level of transmissibility and a certain level of context that people in that society immediately place on that person. There are levels of intelligence that they sign to that person. There are levels of competency that they sign to that person. And many more things that they immediately assign to that person, most of it unconsciously, but all of it has relevance and definitely serves to create a perception of the identity of that person. A person who communicates through language clearly, concisely, and in accordance with the rules of grammar and in accordance with the rules of syntax and with proper syncopation and intention uh, according to agreed upon rules of their society, that puts them at a certain level of trust already. Now, it doesn't mean that they are trustworthy because con people do that too. In fact, they prey on those sorts of things. But going with the normal flow of things, that tells you a lot about a person. Now, accents, dialects, all of those things add character to the language that the person is speaking. And like I said, right now, just verbal language. Now, the important thing, I think the important thing about the cultural language is that the language that we're currently speaking is not something that any of us particularly created in the moment. It is our living connection to our ancestors, to the history of the social connections that we're currently bearing. And it is the living part of the consciousness that travels through time throughout our homo sapien clusters. Now, we're in an era where travel, communication, and connection is globally fluid. So the languages as they, as a consciousness around the globe are starting, you know, they've been coming together for a long time. Now in the modern world, English tends to be the universal language. If I were guessing, I mean, Chinese, like probably Mandarin is probably the second most spoken language on the planet just by volume of people in China. But in terms of like global accessibility, it's probably English first. Uh, I don't know what would be second. It's, you know, either probably like Spanish. I mean, it's probably Mandarin and Spanish, maybe German. Um, and for a while there, French was at the top because that was the language of science. But essentially now, the universal verbal language, the base language is pretty much English, but it's not British English. It's more modern standard English. And modern standard English, its roots, its cultural roots come from America. And when you say that, or when I say that, it means that it's really the world's language. Because you're talking about, it took modern standard English probably became the primary universal language on earth I mean, mid to late 20th century, really with the advent of Hollywood, mass communication, 
and with World War II collapsing, World War One and Two collapsing infrastructure around the rest of the world, and other people honestly really just well, I mean, the British Empire obviously spread English around the world, but then modern standard English in the late 20th century due to the propagation of Hollywood, collapse of the rest of the countries, and really animosity between the other countries amongst themselves, really just left modern standard English being the universal language. It's also an exceptionally simple language. The rules of grammar are really straightforward. It does have some weird, peculiar grammar rules on things in terms of subject verb agreements and a few other things. but. All in all, English is extraordinarily simple language. You can sort of Lego block it together. It's easy to pronounce. And the way it formed in America, it formed in America because citizens from all the rest of the countries of the world came here and started trying to communicate with each other. And English was the language that they sort of built together. The version of a modern American English is the one that we built together where it incorporated all these different concepts and all these different phonetic pronunciations and all of these different, even words got Americanized from other cultures to be thrown into the language pot of America. And then we stirred it around. And then we also are the home of the most mass populous art expression and the most egalitarian artistic mass art expression in human history using English through movies, through popular music, through advertisement, through general media. Uh, there was almost no bar to entry in terms of the socioeconomic level or education level of an American expressing themselves. I mean, many, many of the most influential Americans to ever influence Earth didn't have a high school degree. And they are out there influencing the languages of Earth like nobody else. And they're generally using just modern standard English, which is filled with commonality, filled with normal salts of the earth metaphors, filled with slang and dialect and nowhere near the Queen's English. And when you hear an American speak English, for better or for worse, you can identify them as American almost instantly. And it's the same with most people speaking their language. When you hear an Australian speak English, you know it's Australian. When you hear a Scot speak English, you know it's Scots. When you hear a Frenchman speak French, you know it's French. When you hear a Senegalese speak French, you know it's Senegalese. Like, there's all, like, the cultural identity of our language, it, it's one of our foremost cultural identities. And it's because it's got the momentum of so much history coming through us in the moment in the language that we're speaking. It does access a timeless consciousness and it may be one of the great cult cultural riches that we possess and tap into almost constantly. We dream in the language, we talk in the language, we wish in the language, we express our, it's, it's almost never ending. We almost never get a break from it, which I think when other people study other languages and they get into them, that's one of the things they like is that they get to, they get to go into another cultural stream. And it's one of the primary ways to do it. You know, it's always one of the fundamental questions they ask people when they're studying a foreign language is, well, do you dream in that language now? When I was studying French for a while, I did, I did have dreams in French and it was definitely a fundamental altering of my mindset and of my consciousness to do that. Now, beyond just the verbal language, when we go to language as a broader scope of any form of expression, agreed upon communication with others, that includes the way we dress, that includes the way we serve each other food, that includes protocols, that includes etiquette. These are all languages, expressions, Expressions meant to communicate and connect our language. And so in that sense, all of these different things that we do are cultural identities. If we, if we bow at transactions, that's a cultural identity. If we 
fist bump for something good, that's a cultural identity. If we give a thumbs up, that's a cultural identity. If we, uh, you know, wear a suit and tie and, and you know, uh, demand that things have decorum uh, for periods of time, you know, that's a cultural identity. And that is a language. Like the fashion we wear is a language. The things we do, especially when we do them consciously, are a language. And they're almost always born out of cultural momentum. And until a person becomes conscious of it and perhaps creates their own, which I would say is the role of an artist, when a person becomes an artist, they have determined that they know how now to create culture and that they start living their cultural identity as expressed through their own creativity in a transcendental manner. So it's not that culture is some sort of prison or has strength of inertia that cannot be escaped or transcended, but it is the base level of the cultural reality and the energetic reality that each of us is born into. And so our expressions that come from within it show and display our cultural identity. And I know in the modern era, cultural identity is associated with so many different things and they try to get pinned down. But the reality of it is that wherever we're at in the now is our current cultural identity. And it's, it doesn't always sound as exotic, you know, like, if you live in the San Fernando Valley in Los Angeles and you drive a Hyundai and you live in an apartment and you eat at Taco Bell and you have a job, then that's your current cultural identity. You have connections to ancestors. Those ancestors, they might've come from Switzerland. They might've come from Mexico. You know, they might be uh, European bankers or they might be, you know, Aztec warriors, right? But if you're sitting in the San Fernando Valley eating Taco Bell in your apartment, you're a modern American and <laughs> your cultural identity at the moment is essentially uh, Netflix and a person that eats Taco Bell and drives a Hyundai and, you know, listens to rap and hip hop on Spotify and speaks in a certain way and enjoys your life a certain way and you express yourself a certain way. And in that person, in that made up example, you know, maybe the, one of the ways they ex express themselves is they bought a huge subwoofer for the Hyundai and they go around and they, you know, play bass music really loud and because they're expressing their feeling of power and dominance, right? Getting that into the environment. And then they hang out with their friends and, you know, they smoke a little bud and they get swaggy and they like dap each other up and they're feeling good about themselves and that gets them into the flow of their culture. And then, you know, they're feeling good and then they meet a mate and then all of a sudden, you know, things are going well. And that is where you're at, right? So now that's your modern cultural identity. And that's not to say you're still the momentum. You're still the fountainhead of all the ancestral cultural DNA that brought you into this moment, but it's important not to be blind to what your actual real cultural identity is in the moment. Like I'm a person sitting on a bench in Beverly Hills doing philosophy videos. And you know, I went to West Point and I've lived all around the world and I've been a military pilot and a comedian and da 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 da. And so here's where I'm at. I'm a modern American sitting here communicating on the internet around a bunch of people and talking to you and being on YouTube, right? And so YouTube is my language right now. It's an expression. So I think, I think, I think we get the idea, right? So we're connected to all the exotic ideas of, you know, ancestors and culture and all that stuff. And those, and those things reside within us and they've helped create us in this moment. But also, we're firmly in the now. And the more we listen to ourselves and understand the languages coming out of us, the verbal language, the expressive language, the fashion language, our position in things, 
and the more we have clarity about it, and the more we bring the unconscious into the conscious, then we can truly know thyself. And when we know thyself, then we can truly become transcendental. And when we become transcendental, then we can create ourselves freely. And that's really the beautiful point of being cultured. Just like a pearl gets cultured with, you know, the many, the many layers around the pearl until it's perfectly smooth and beautiful, it takes so many layers of culturing. When we have so many layers of culturing and we become self-aware of it and we can participate in the process consciously, then we become something truly beautiful to the universe. Well, thanks for spending some time here at Philosopher's Corner. I hope you found it helpful and uh, have fun.